Okay, everyone, welcome back to our webinar series, Introduction and Access to Global Air Quality Forecasting Data and Tools. This is session two, Global Air Quality Forecasting at NASA. My name is Melanie Follett Cook. Um, I'm a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center right outside Washington, DC. I'm very excited to talk to you today. So here's an outline of our webinar series agenda. So session one, hosted by my colleague, Dr. Pawan Gupta, covered the science behind air quality forecasting and the parallels to weather forecasting. Pawan talked about different methods that can be used to forecast air quality, ranging from simple persistent model, persistence models all the way up to very complex three-dimensional atmospheric chemistry models. Today, we'll talk about air quality relevant forecast and reanalysis products from one of those complex three-dimensional models, the NASA GEOS Earth System model. And that's me there on the left, hello. So today, by the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll be able to identify the different air quality relevant model outputs available from the Goddard Earth Observing System, or GEOS, Earth System model. Understand the difference between analysis, reanalysis, and forecasting, and understand the different ways satellite observations are used for forecasting, reanalysis, and evaluation. And also discover how you can subset and visualize both reanalysis and forecast outputs. The Goddard Earth Observing System model is a global model that actually consists of a group of different model components, an atmospheric general circulation model, or AGCM, an ocean general circulation model, and the catchment land surface model. These models can be connected in different configurations in order to address questions related to different aspects of Earth science. GS model development uses the modular architecture of Earth system modeling framework, which simplifies the management of both model code and the different configurations that the model can be run in. GEOS is designed to function seamlessly across many different scales and applications. These applications include real-time atmospheric analyses and forecasts, and long-term atmospheric reanalysis, which we'll talk about today. GEOS is also used to produce coupled atmosphere-ocean seasonal forecasts and study climate variability and change on decadal scales, including using, using uh, coupled atmosphere chemistry simulations to project the evolution of the ozone hole. Because of NASA's high computing capabilities, GEOS can also be run at very high spatial resolutions, even as fine as 1.5 kilometers. Global high resolution simulations like these form the basis for observing system simulation experiments, or OSSEs. OSSEs are a way to look at the impact of new satellite observations on the quality of products produced. And so it's important to be able to simulate those observations on similar scales as the instrument resolutions. So in this presentation, we're going to focus primarily on the Atmospheric General Circulation Model, or AGCM, and specifically the simulation of aerosols and trace gas chemistry within the AGCM. The AGCM is a global three-dimensional atmospheric model. It's a grid-based model, meaning the atmosphere is divided into a set of three-dimensional grid cells. The size of the grid cell determines the spatial resolution of the model. The smaller the grid cell, the more detailed the information, and the more computing power needed to run the model. Because of the computing power required, in most cases, if very high resolution or smaller grid cells is needed, the model domain will be smaller. But like I described earlier, GEOS can be run for short time periods at 1.5 kilometer spatial resolution. 
The figure on the left shows the typical latitude longitude grid that you might think about when you think about dividing the globe up into grid cells. But GEOS is actually run on what's called a cubed sphere grid. This type of grid is used to ensure a uniform spatial grid and is better for scalability at the large range of resolutions GEOS can be run on. The AGCM simultaneously simulates the physics, dynamics, and chemistry within each grid cell. For trace gas chemistry and aerosols, the emission, transport, chemistry, and removal of these species is also simulated. Emissions are a key component of air quality forecasting and can be read in as a model input, or the model can have a parameterization that estimates the emission of a species within the model itself. An example of a model input would be emissions from sources like power plants or cars, or an example of an emission that is usually parameterized within a model is something like dust emissions, which are usually a function of soil wetness or wind speed. Throughout today's presentation, I'm going to use terms like forecast, analysis, reanalysis, and data simulation. So before we continue, I wanted to pause and define some of these terms and show how they relate to one another. When you want to forecast future conditions, it's best to start from a best estimate of current conditions. Data assimilation is the process of assimilating or incorporating observations into a model state to produce the best current estimate of the atmosphere, land, or ocean. So we see here, we have our model state and our observations, and through the assimilation of those observations, we produce an analysis, which is an updated model state and a blend of the model and observations. Now, starting from our current updated model state, which represents our best estimate of current conditions, we can issue a forecast, where starting from our best estimate, a simulation is run forward in time to predict a future state. But as you can imagine, the analysis fields are very useful for scientific studies, but both data simulation techniques, forecast models, and the observations themselves are evolving and improving. So you can't really examine these analysis fields over long periods of time together because there'll be inconsistencies as a result of the changes that I've just described. So a reanalysis uses data assimilation to blend a forecast model simulation of the past with past satellite observations using a consistent data assimilation technique and a single model version to produce a long-term data set that can be used for longer-term analyses. We'll talk more about reanalysis later in the presentation. This webinar will focus on the near real-time weather and chemical forecasts and reanalysis products from GS. The GS Forward Processing Analysis and Forecast, or GSFP, the GS Composition Forecast, or GSCF, and the Modern Era Retrospective Analysis for Research and Applications Version 2, or MERA 2 Reanalysis. Before going into the details of each system, I want to emphasize that the GS Neo Real Time Forecasts are dynamic and evolving systems. GSFP in particular is updated every six to 12 months through either the introduction of new observations into the data simulation system or through an update in the forecast model. So the information I'm going to show and link to here represents the current information as of now in September 2021. So if you're viewing this in the future, Hello from the past. For the latest information, please visit the GMAO website shown here. The NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Office, or GMAO, maintains and develops the GEOS Earth System model. So throughout this presentation, I've tried to include both the current information and where you should check to see if there have been updates.
So first, we'll start with GS FP. The GS Forward Processing, or GSFP, offers publicly available forecasts of weather, aerosols, and carbon monoxide, all on the same spatial scale. The animation on the right shows GSFP aerosols for December 2019. In this animation, each type of aerosol is assigned a different color, as shown below the animation. In a few slides, we'll talk about the different types of aerosols included in FP. FP forecasts support NASA field campaigns who make use of the forecasts for flight planning and real-time analysis. GSFP also provides boundary conditions for regional models and provides the meteorology for chemical forecasts from other models, such as the whole atmosphere community climate model or WACM and chemistry transport models like GSChem. As I said earlier, GSFP is a dynamic state of the science system, so it's updated every six to 12 months. So users who want to use the FP forecast or analysis fields to drive other models are urged to make sure that your simulation period doesn't span one of these updates because it can introduce inconsistencies. The GMAO near real time product webpage linked here has details and dates for the latest model updates. Here's a quick reference table for information about the FP analyses and forecasts. FP forecasts are issued twice a day, a 10-day forecast initialized at 0Z, and a five-day forecast initialized at 12Z. The forecast model and data simulation are run at about 12 kilometers spatial resolution on the cubed sphere, but the output is saved on a traditional latitude longitude grid at about 25 kilometers spatial resolution. Two-dimensional output products are available for every hour and three-dimensional products are available every three hours. There are 72 levels in the vertical extending from near the surface to 0.1 hectopascals. Analysis fields are available back to 2014. Forecast fields are available for about three weeks. So in this presentation, I'll focus on air quality relevant FP output, but a full and detailed description of all of the FP output, output can be found within the most current file specification document. And I've linked to that here. But in the future, you can check to see if there's a more recent version of the document on the near real-time product page or in the link at the bottom of this slide. Every six hours, over 5 million observations are assimilated into GS. This animation shows an example of the wide variety of observations that are assimilated. The GSFP data assimilation uses what's called a hybrid four-dimensional ensemble variational or hybrid 4D NVAR approach. This approach uses an iterative method to correct the model forecast in both space and time. For aerosols, GEOS simulates observations of aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers from the MODIS Aqua and MODIS Terra sensors. It's important to remember that aerosol optical depth is a unitless optical quantity that indicates the total extinction by all aerosol species throughout the atmosphere column. So, when the AOD is increased or decreased as a result of the assimilation, the model decides how this change is distributed in the vertical and how it is distributed among the various aerosol species. The aerosols in GSFP are simulated with a radiatively coupled version of the Goddard Chemistry Aerosol Radiation and Transport Model, or GOKART. GOKART is a bulk aerosol scheme that consists of 18 aerosol tracers, dust in five non-interacting size bins, sea salt in five size bins, hydrophobic and hydrophilic black and organic carbon, sulfate and nitrate. Both dust and sea salt have wind speed dependent emissions. Sulfate, nitrate, black carbon and organic carbon have emissions from fossil fuel combustion, 
biomass burning and biofuel consumption with additional sources, uh, biogenic sources for organic carbon. Sulfate is also produced by the chemical oxidation of sulfur dioxide gas or SO2 and dimethyl sulfide. A future version of go-kart will include a brown carbon species for biomass burning emissions of uh, organic carbon. Go-kart simulates the emission, chemistry, and loss for all the species listed on the previous slide. References for the emission sources are listed here. For more information about the Quick Fire Emissions Database or QFED Fire Emissions, you can actually review sessions three and four of a previous RSET webinar, Satellite Observations and Tools for Fire Risk Detection and Analysis, and I've included the link um, to that webinar series here. Loss processes for all aerosols include wet and dry deposition, scavenging by convection and large-scale wet removal, and sedimentation. So this is an example file name for a GIOS FP output file. So in these next slides, I'm going to walk you through how to interpret this and to find the output that is most relevant for your particular application. All output from GIOS is organized into collections that group like variables together. In GSFP, collections are organized by frequency, number of dimensions, the group description, and the horizontal and vertical grid. The frequency indicates whether the output file shows instantaneous values at a given time interval or whether the output is a time average and what that time averaging interval is. So in other words, a three hourly instantaneous collection will contain the model output at exactly those times. A three hour time averaged collection will contain model output averaged over a three hour time period. And the time label will be the center of that time average. The dimensions, indicates the dimensions of the variables included in that collection. So 2D files will only have two dimensional variables, but files labeled 3D can have both two dimensional and three dimensional variables within it. The group is a three letter abbreviation for the type of variables in the collection. For example, AER represents the file that has aerosol related var variable fields. The file specification document lists all the different groups and their meanings. The horizontal and vertical grid is indicated by two letters. The first is usually N, indicating that it's the nominal horizontal grid. The vertical grid is indicated by the letters X for horizontal 2D grids, P for output on three-dimensional pressure level grid, V for output on the native 72 model levels, and E for output on the native model level edges. So those will have uh, 73 vertical levels. The collection names tell you almost everything you need to know about the contents of a file. The rest of the file name contains information on the mode, time, and file version. The mode indicates whether that file is from the assimilation or the forecast. The assimilation files are the analysis fields that are used to initialize the forecast. The time is indicated by the format shown here. For a forecast file, both the assimilation cycle and forecast time will be part of the file name. The file version is usually V01 and GSFP files are all in NetCDF4 format. So going back to our file name, we can now interpret what each piece of this long name means. The GSFP indicates that this is from GSFP, or the FCST indicates that it's a forecast rather than from the analysis fields. The TAVG3, 2D, AER, and X, that's the collection name, 
tells us that this file contains two-dimensional, three-hour time average aerosol variables, and the time indicates that this file is for a forecast initialized at on September 1st, 2021 at 0Z, and the output contained in the file is valid for September 2nd, 2021 at 1330Z. And this represents the center point of a three hour time averaging period between 12 and 15Z. Again, the file spe specification document will contain detailed information about every variable in every collection. But I wanted to highlight some particular collections with air quality relevant output. Aerosol related collections are output at three hourly instantaneous or time average intervals. These collections contain information about aerosol optical properties, surface concentrations, column density, emissions, removal, and 3D mass mixing ratios of each aerosol species in each size bin. Unfortunately, as of right now, PM2.5 is not an output variable. This will be corrected in a future version of GSFP. So for now, I wanted to make sure I included how to calculate it using the output. The variables needed are in the T average 3 2D AERNX collection that's shown here in the top row. The variable names and the equation that's recommended to use is shown here on the slide. One more note that nitrates were added to the FP system in about January of 2017. So if using the analysis fields that are available before that time, to calculate PM2.5, you should use the equation I'll show later that is used for MERA2, which also does not have nitrates. So now I'll show a few cases, a few case studies of FP forecasts and analysis. This year, 2021, continues a trend of increased wildfire activity in the Western US. The left figure shows aerosol optical depth for black carbon and organic carbon, which are the primary aerosol emission, source, uh, aerosol emissions of fires. This figure is for Wednesday, July 21st, 2021 at 6C. The figure on the right shows surface observations, those are in the red line, the different GEOS forecasts initialized at zero Z in circles, and the analysis in black for Boise, Idaho from July 3rd to July 18th. GSFP accurately simulates current conditions and forecast for the amount of PM2.5 as a result from the smoke from the wildfires in this region. Beginning on July 10th, GSFP does start overestimating PM2.5 at the surface. And this overestimation could be due to the fact that GSFP does not currently have the capability to loft fire emissions high into the atmosphere, like you might expect to happen from intense hot fire activity. So because of this, aerosol concentrations might be too high near the surface. Another case study, during June 2020, dust was transported across the Atlantic Ocean in an event called the Godzilla Dust Event. Ground observations in the Caribbean recorded the highest aerosol loading in the last 20 year period. And surface concentrations there were almost three times higher than the 24 hour EPA standard limit. GSFP analysis fields that are shown in the top figure show the Saharan dust on June 26, 2020 at 14Z. Darker orange colors represent a higher concentration of dust particles in the atmosphere. Looking at the observed aerosol optical depth from the VIRS instrument, which is not assimilated in FP in the bottom figure, we can see that GEOS accurately simulates the spatial extent of this extreme plume. Next, we'll move on and talk about 
GEOS Composition Forecasts, or GEOS-CF. The GEOS-CF forecast uses analysis and forecast fields from the GEOS system along with the GEOS Chem chemical mechanism to forecast global three-dimensional distributions of both trace gases and aerosols. The movie on the right is just a small snapshot of a longer movie from the NASA Science Visualization Studio, showing a lot more species. You should check it out. GEOS Chem is a community-developed global three-dimensional model of atmospheric chemistry and consists of over 250 chemical species and over 725 chemical reactions. The GEOS Chem code base is located in Git repositories, which allows advances and developments to the code base to be used by both the academic research community and the GEOS systems in the GMAO. GFCF forecasts support NASA field campaigns and allow the broader community to examine the interactions between atmospheric transport, surface emissions, chemical processes, and removal processes that result in global predictions of surface air quality. Questions about GFCF can be sent to the email address that I've shown here on the slide. The GSCF forecast begins with a simulation of the previous day. Since there's no data in assimilation in the GSCF system, the forecast initial conditions are provided by this simulation using what's called a replay technique to constrain the model meteorology. The replay technique is actually very similar to the data assimilation I, I described earlier. The difference is that instead of observations being used to update the model state, an analysis field is used instead. In the case of GSCF, the analysis fields used are from a separate near real-time system called GSFPIT or GSFP for instrument teams. FPIT is a frozen version of GSFP that is actually very similar to the version that is used to create the MERA2 reanalysis. Because it is a consistent model version, these replay fields from GSCF can be used as a continuous atmosphere composition archive. The other difference between the replay technique and the data simulation in GSFP is that the, is that the replay technique uses a three, 3D variational or 3D VAR data assimilation technique. In the GSCF system, two aerosol schemes are run simultaneously. The first is go-kart, which is radiatively coupled to the AGCM. And GSCM also includes its own aerosol module, which is somewhat similar to go-kart in that it is a bulk aerosol scheme. GSCM also contains the same aerosol uh, composition, dust, sea salt, carbonation aerosols, sulfate, and nitrate. And GS Chem also includes secondary organic aerosols. For more details about the differences between GoCart and GS Chem aerosols, you can visit the GS Chem website that I've linked to here. And for full details of GSCF, you can see the Keller et al. paper that I've linked to here as well. This slide is more of a reference slide showing all of the different emission sources for GSCF. For the full description of these, again, see the Keller paper and uh, the file specification document for GSCF also contains a lot of these references. And here is our quick reference table again with the GSCF added the one-day replay and five-day CF forecasts are issued once a day, initialized at 12Z. The replay and forecast are run at about 25 kilometers spatial resolution and saved on a traditional latitude longitude grid at that same resolution, 25 kilometers. Most outputs are available for every hour and a special collection of surface outputs are available at a high temporal frequency of 15 minute increments. 
Similar to FP, there are 72 levels in the vertical, extending from near the surface to 0.1 hectopascals. The replay fields are available back to 2018. And again, since the model version and assimilation technique have remained consistent over that time, this can be considered as a continuous atmosphere composition archive. Forecasts of the air quality, air quality relevant surface concentrations collection are available back through 2019. And the full forecast output is available for about two weeks. The full and detailed description of all CF output can be found within the file specification document linked here. Again, visit the link at the bottom to make sure there isn't uh, an update or a more recent document. CF output is also organized into collections, but have a slightly different format than FP. In GSCF, collections are organized by group, time interval, frequency, and the horizontal and vertical grid. But similar to FP, the group is a three-letter abbreviation for the type of variables in the collection. Some examples are shown here. The AQC group refers to the air quality relevant group. The time indicates whether the output file shows instantaneous values at a given time interval or whether the output is a time average. And then the frequency is how often it is output for that time averaging interval. The horizontal grid is expressed as a letter, either G for global or R for regional, followed by the horizontal resolution expressed as the number of grid cells in the longitudinal direction and the number of grid cells in the latitudinal direction. The vertical grid is indicated by a letter and a number. The letter indicates the type of vertical level where X equals 2D fields, P indicates pressure levels, and V is output on the model levels. The number shows how many vertical levels are included. GSCF file names also consist of information on the version, mode, and timestamp. The file version is usually V01. The mode indicates whether that file is from the replay or the forecast, and the time is indicated by the format shown here for a forecast file. Um, both the assimilation cycle and forecast time will be part of the file name. All GSCF files are NetCDF4 format similar to FP. So we can now interpret this very long GOCF file name. The GOCF V01FCST indicates that this is a forecast file from GOCF. The next part is the collection, chem T average one hour G1440, by 721 underscore V1 collection. That tells us that this file contains one hour time averaged chemical species at the global quarter degree horizontal resolution for a single model layer. The time indicates that this file is for a forecast initialized on March 9th, 2019 at 12Z and the output is valid for the time for March 14th, 2019 at 7.30Z, which represents the center point of a one hour time averaging period between seven and eight Z. Here, I'm again highlighting particular collections available from GSCF. The high frequency collection contains instantaneous surface chemistry and meteorology output every 15 minutes. The air quality concentrations collection contains one hour time average surface concentrations of CO, NO2, ozone, PM2.5 from GS Chem, and SO2. Other collections contain surface values of many more species or column quantities, emission and removal information, and three-dimensional distributions of several species on pressure levels. For PM2.5, values are available from both GoCart and GSChem. The GoCart PM2.5 values are only available in the high frequency collection. 
there are also instantaneous and one hour time average in collections containing meteorology, meteorology variables available from GSCF. Here are some case studies and highlights using GSCF. This animation shows the evolution of global surface ozone from July to August 2018. Ozone is a pollutant produced and destroyed through interactions of various chemical species, such as nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds in the presence of sunlight, and requires a complex chemical mechanism and a lot of computational power to simulate accurately. Watching this animation, you can actually see the increases in ozone in the sunlit portions of the globe. Forecasted concentrations of pollutants like ozone, NO2, and PM2.5 can actually be combined to calculate global air quality indices. Here's another case study for May and June of 2019. Smoke from wildfires in Southwest Canada led to poor air quality throughout the Northwest US. Here, red triangles indicate major active fires the top animation shows PM2.5 emitted from these fires. The bottom panel shows an animation over the same time, but for ozone. Ozone is not directly emitted from fires, but you can see the impact of the fires on ozone concentrations. Within the smoke plume, high concentrations of NO consume ozone, leading to lower ozone levels or lighter colors near the fire sources. However, as the plume mixes with surrounding air, ozone is produced, leading to increased concentrations near the plume edges. Ozone produced in wildfire plumes can be comparable to urban pollution levels. The Keller et al. paper I've mentioned before contains a detailed evaluation of GSCF ozone, NO2, CO, SO2, aer aerosol optical depth, or AOD, and PM2.5, using a variety of ground-based and satellite observations, <clears throat> which are shown here in this table. They include both an evaluation of the replay and the forecast. And here, I'll highlight some of the evaluation done for GSCF aerosols. Comparison against satellite observations is the only way to evaluate a model on a truly global scale. Here, GSCF replay aerosol optical depth, shown on the top left, is compared with AOD from MODIS Aqua. The difference between them is shown on the bottom left, average for all of 2018 and 2019. To compare the two on temporal scales, Monthly averages are shown for six regions on the right, and these regions correspond to the rectangles on the difference map. Overall, GSCF shows higher AOD than MODIS, but captures the spatial and seasonal patterns seen in the satellite observations. The overprediction is likely the result of a number of factors, first of which is the use of HTAP SO2 emissions. These emissions are valid for the year 2010, but since 2010, many countries have dramatically reduced their SO2 emissions. And use of that emissions inventory leads to the overestimation of SO2 emissions, which leads to an overestimation of the sulfate aerosol. The paper also mentions that GSCAM has a known issue with the overprediction of aerosol nitrate, especially over China. And these are issues that will be corrected in a future version of GSCF. These figures show comparisons between the GSCF replay and about 2,600 surface PM2.5 observations from the OpenAQ air quality observation platform. We see a very similar picture as previously. Overestimations are seen over Europe, North America, and Asia for the region I just outlined. But it should be noted that even though at about 25 kilometer spatial resolution that GSCF is one of the highest resolution global air quality models. And a 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer grid cell likely does not truly represent 
what a single measurement will observe, especially in urban areas where concentrations change on much smaller spatial scales than 25 kilometers. These figures show the evaluation of forecast skill for surface ozone, NO2, and PM2.5. The top row shows the normalized mean bias, and from the replay shown here as day minus one on the left, throughout the forecast shown as plus one to plus five days. The model shows low biases, and the skill doesn't change very much over the course of the forecast. The same is true for the normalized root mean square error shown in the center row. The bottom row does show a decrease in correlation in time as the forecast evolves. This is likely the impact of transport errors in the meteorology. Another note is that for fires in particular, the model assumes that every fire observed persists and emits the same amount throughout the forecast period. So this means that the model can't know if a fire is no longer emitting or if the intensity has changed. Both of these changes could result in potentially significant changes in, in the surface air quality. Last but not least, we'll talk about the MERITU reanalysis. Talked a little bit about reanalysis earlier in this session. We're going to review a little bit more here. A reanalysis is a consistent reprocessing of Earth system observations using a modern, unchanging data simulation system. The process relies on an underlying forecast model to combine disparate observations in a physically consistent manner. This enables production of gridded data sets for a broad range of variables, including ones that are sparsely or not directly observed by satellite. Reanalyses have become fundamental to research and education in the earth sciences because they attempt to take advantage of the best features of both models and observations to produce four-dimensional gridded output that optimally combines the continuity of a model with real-world observations that may be sparse or irregularly spaced, both spatially and temporally. Reanalyses have many applications, including their use as initial or boundary conditions for regional air quality forecasting, or as a priori profile for satellite retrievals. They're used in climate monitoring, monitoring and for other applications, such as with the energy and agricultural communities. The modern era retrospective analysis for research for research and applications version two or MERA two reanalysis provides output from 1980 to the present day. MERA two is produced at a slightly coarser resolution than FP at about at a resolution of about 50 kilometers. There are a wide variety of meteorological, chemical, and aerosol variables available from MERA two. The Meritu team is always asking for derived quantities that might be useful to applications communities. Um, for example, the wind energy community wants, uh, found winds at 50 meters to be useful. So now that is an output from Meritu. You can find a link to um, input your feedback at the Meritu page linked here. Going back to our reference table, I have added Meritu here on the right. Again, MERA2 outputs are available on hourly, daily, and monthly scales. But similar to GSFP and CF, there are 72 levels in the vertical, extending from near the surface to 0.1 hectopascals. Output is available back to 1980, and the latest output runs a few weeks behind real time. The full and detailed description of all MERA2 output can be found in the file specification document linked here at the bottom. In the beginning of the MERA2 period, there were many less observations than there are today. The left-hand side of this animation shows the observing system in 1980, which consisted of a few polar orbiting satellites wind estimates from geostationary satellites, and global surface and upper air observations. 
every six hours, a median number of about 175,000 observations were assimilated. The right-hand side shows the observing system closer to today in 2018. In addition to expansion in number of sensors and what they observe over these past decades, the quality of the observations has also advanced significantly. Now, Meritu assimilates a median number of 5 million observations every six hours. A unique feature of Meritu is the assimilation of AOD. The table shown here summarizes the aerosol optical depth observing system used in Meritu. It's important to remember that only aerosol optical depth is assimilated. Non-observed aerosol properties, such as the vertical distribution or the aerosol composition, are not fully constrained by the assimilation and will strongly resemble the model in most cases. Also, when there are no available observations, such as during the nighttime or when retrieval, when retrieval algorithms filter out data with less certainty, like in the case of cloud cover or sun glint. In these cases, Meritu will draw towards the model. This figure shows the number of aerosol observations in millions that are assimilated into Meritu. You can easily see that during this time period, there are jumps in the number of observations. So when using Meritu to perform long-term analyses, you must take care to take this into account. Since about 2000 or 2003, the observation system has been relatively stable. Similar to FP, the aerosols in Meritu are simulated with a radiatively coupled version of go-kart. One big difference between the go-kart version in FP and the go-kart version in Meritu is that there are no nitrate aerosols in Meritu. This becomes important in calculating PM2.5. Then again, here is a reference slide showing the aerosol emissions used for Meritu. Meritu collections are actually very similar to those by uh, very similar to those of FP and are organized by frequency, number of dimensions, group description, and the horizontal and vertical grid. Again, the frequency indicates whether the output file shows instantaneous values at a given time interval, or whether the output is a time average and what that time averaging interval is. One difference is in the Mera 2 collections, the averaging interval can also be indicated by a D for daily mean, an M for a monthly mean, or a U for a monthly diurnal mean. The rest of the collection description is the same as FP. The file specification document has a list of all of the different groups and their meanings. Meritu file names start with Meritu and are followed by information about which production stream was used to produce that file. These numbers are usually 100, 200, 300, or 400, and this is followed by uh, the collection and then the timestamp. Another difference from FP in the case of Mira 2, if a collection has an instantaneous or a time averaging frequency of less than one day, then all of the time steps will be included in a single daily file. And now we can interpret this Mira 2 file name. Mira 2 400 tells us that this is a Mira 2 file from the fourth assimilation stream. The T average M 2D AER NX tells us that this collection contains two dimensional, monthly time averaged aerosol species on the horizontal grid. And 202106 indicates that this file contains monthly averages for June 2021. Meritu collections with air quality relevant output are also very similar to those of FP. 
their output at three hourly instantaneous or one hour time average intervals. These collections contain information about aerosol optical properties, surface concentration, column quantities, emissions, removal, and 3D mass mixing ratios of each aerosol species in each size bin. Again, similar to FP, unfortunately, PM2.5 is also not an output variable for MERA2. So again, I've included the recommendation, uh, the recommended equation to use to calculate it. The variables needed are shown here and are included in the T average one 2D AER NX collection shown in the top row here. When evaluating a reanalysis, it's essential to compare against observations that haven't been assimilated to ensure an independent validation. The Bouchard et al. 2017 paper linked here contains a detailed observation of Meritu aerosols. I'm gonna highlight a few examples from that analysis. These plots show comparisons between daytime profiles from the Calliope LIDAR shown in red and Mera 2 shown in black. These profiles are averaged over dust transport regions from Northern Africa to the North Atlantic, biomass burning regions of Southern Africa and the Amazon, and over the continental United States. The cyan colored line shows results from, this, from a similar model as was used to create Mera 2, except without the AOD assimilation. So you can interpret the difference between the cyan and black lines as showing the impact of the AOD assimilation. Generally, MERA2 well represents the calliope profiles over these important aerosol source regions, although near the surface, it's underestimated in Northern and Southern Africa. This underestimation is likely due to underestimated backscatter from sea salt aerosols over the ocean. Overall, the AOD assimilation improves the vertical distribution of aerosols with respect to these LIDAR observations. MERIT-2 includes assimilation of AOD from various ground and satellite-based sensors. However, the assimilation does not directly constrain the absorbing aerosol optical depth or AAOD. We can therefore consider a comparison of these aerosol properties to observations as an independent validation point for MERA2. This figure compares the monthly mean OMI AAOD shown at the top to the MERA2 AAOD shown on the bottom for July 2007. Overall, the AAOD shows good agreement with OMI, particularly over regions of Africa influenced by dust and smoke. These plots show comparisons between monthly mean MERA2 PM2.5, shown as red and black solid lines, to observations from the EPA Air Quality Service or AQS network and the improved network. EPA here is shown as gray dashed lines and improve are shown as dashed red lines over the United States for the period 2003 to 2012. Improved PM2.5 are generally lower than the EPA network due to their geographical location in mostly rural or remote areas. Overall, there's better agreement between MERA2 and the observations over the rurally located improved stations. And the largest negative model biases are found in the wintertime compared to the EPA station. And it's worth restating again that it's difficult for a 50 kilometer model grid cell to represent the variability that might be found at a given monitoring station, particularly for urban areas. That kind of explains why MERA2 agrees better with the more rurally background uh, improved stations. And here's a case study highlighting the use of MERA2 by our own Dr. Pawan Gupta. Um, they used MERA2 meteorological and aerosol output variables, along with ground observations of PM2.5 from 
51 stations to train a machine learning model to predict PM2.5 over Thailand. The figure on the left shows hourly PM2.5 concentrations from 2018. MERA2 is on the y-axis and observations are on the x-axis. The figure on the right shows the same quantities, except the y-axis is the machine learning predicted PM2.5. And the machine learning predicted PM2.5 shows better correlation and reduced bias with respect to the observations. The machine learning under predicts high values of PM2.5, likely because these high values made up less than about 2% of the training data set. A potential application of this algorithm would be to use it to bias correct the entire MERA2 entire time period, creating a more accurate long-term data set to use to analyze spatiotemporal trends over this region. Here, I've included a reference slide that contains a lot of the different references I've included throughout the entire presentation and links to all of these different references. So now I wanna move into a demonstration of the GMAO website where we can view visualizations and find more information about the uh, near real-time prediction systems and reanalysis that we've talked about today. So here, is the GMAO website and the different areas in which the GEOS model is used that I've talked about earlier. We're gonna focus now on the weather analysis and prediction section. If you click on this, you can see here is the latest information about GSFP and GSCF. Clicking on the GEOS near real time data product information link, this is where you can find the latest information about the latest updates that have gone on for FP. Scrolling down, again, this is the latest information. The current version of FP has been active since February of 2021. Here are links to the latest, most current file specification documents. And scrolling down, and you can find the same information for GSCF. We go back, you can see here, there are links to visualize FP and CF output. Clicking on read more about GSCF, we can see here uh, the email address with which you can email any questions or issues um, with GSCF. Going back, so if you click on either of these links, you get redirected to the GMAO Fluid website. This website shows you different visualizations for the FP, CF, and MERA2 output. The different types of maps are listed here on the left, and different ways you can access the data are listed here on the bottom left. Uh, first, we'll kind of just quickly click through um, some of the types of maps available, and then we'll uh, go more into data access. So first, um, first I'll click on atmospheric composition maps, clicking on the chem maps link, and it just takes a second, brings up two dimensional maps of atmospheric composition. And since this is FP, um, it's primarily going to be aerosols and CO. And even though surface PM 2.5 is not an FP output directly, it's calculated here and you can visualize surface PM2.5 from FP for different regions. The Atlantic region is selected here, different forecast initialization times, and the different forecast valid times, the lead hour. You can animate these and download the movie. So you can see the types of variables that are available here are the surface maps of the speciated aerosols, as well as the aerosol optical thickness of the individual components and the total aerosol optical depth. Going back, clicking on 3D chem maps brings you to uh, visualizing the same types of variables, but at different levels of the atmosphere. So here we see the different aerosol components, 
in addition to PM 2.5 at 850 hectopascals. Since this is at an individual pressure level, you'll see the influence of topography on the map where uh, the mountainous regions are masked out. So the these are the different pressure levels available. We can click even further towards the surface and even more of those regions are masked out. Again, you can view different regions, different initialization times and forecast times. Before I move on to CF, um, I did wanna point out the datagrams. So the datagrams are a way to view the forecast output in the vertical for individual point locations. So in this case, here are the available variables to observe. Let's look at total aerosols. And what this tells us is at Washington, DC, this is the vertical profile of total aerosol. Right now, the extinction tab is selected. That's an optical property. We want to click on concentration. So here is the total particulate matter concentration throughout the forecast in the vertical. There's also information about the speciation at the surface. Um, we see each of the species represented by different colors. We also have some meteorological information for this point, percent cloud cover, as well as information on precipitation. You can change the city here using these drop-down menus for select cities in the United States, across the world, aeronet locations, and megacities, and for active field campaigns. So now, going back, now we can click on CF and see a similar set of options uh, for map for visualizations. If we click on the datagrams, we see again a similar similar features as for visualizing FP, except for here we have CO, NO2, ozone, PM2.5, and SO2. Clicking on PM2.5. And again, this is the vertical profile of PM2.5 throughout the forecast. And I should note that since this is PM 2.5 from CF, it is PM 2.5 from GSCAM. And so you see the addition of the secondary, secondary organic aerosols um, component of the total PM 2.5. Again, there's information about cloud cover and total precipitation. And they have a similar feature where you can select um, different stations. And going back to surface concentrations. Again, very similar. You can view surface maps of NO2, ozone CO, SO2, or PM2.5 and change the different visualization region and time and forecast hour. CF also has a beta site that is being tested. So I'm going to manually type in underscore map after CF. And this brings us to a site that is under development. But um, any if you decide to explore this site and come across any bugs or um, suggestions, um, feel free to email the GIOS CF email that I showed earlier. This site is continuously, you're looking for updates for optimization and bug repair, so um, gladly accept any feedback. Here you're looking at surface NO2, ozone, and PM2.5. Here are the options for forecast date, time, you can change the color map. And uh, again, you can select any station available from these drop-down menus. 
But what's really unique about this particular site is it allows you to interact with the map. So I can hover over and scroll, zoom in, and pan, and say I would like to know the forecast over, say, San Francisco. I click, and you have the options of getting the forecast data or the historical data. So again, great abilities of this site, um, but this is a really cool advancement, being able to interact with the maps in this way. So going back, um, the last thing I wanna show here, as far as visualizations, is clicking on the reanalysis tab, there are maps available to visualize MERA2 output. Again, clicking on the CHEM maps. We see we have very similar fields available um, for MERA2 as FP. So the surface mass of different components, the column mass, as well as the aerosol optical thickness and totals. We'll click on surface PM2.5 as an example. So here, you're seeing surface PM2.5, and what I can do is I can click and just change the date to as far back as 1980. Here, I'll just pick 1981. Hit Enter. And it just takes a minute for the system to work. I had to click away from it. And here, now I am looking at surface PM 2.5 from August 31st, 1981. So here is a way, a nice quick way to visualize um, fields of interest for MERA 2. Going back here, by clicking this link, you get to the MERA 2.5, sorry, MERA 2. <laughs> If you get to the MERA2 reanalysis page on the GMAO website. Here, you, there is also a link to the NASA Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, or JESDISC, with which you can download all or subset the MERA2 data. So clicking on that link will bring you here, directly to where you can download MERA2 data. In order to interact with this site at all, you need an Earth Data login, which you can, I'll just click this, and we can just register here. It's very quick and free. And then you'll have access to all of the JESDISC options. Um, I also recommend if you scroll down here, JESDISC, if you click here under resources, under how to, the JESDISC has a really amazing list of resources here for interacting with its data in general. Like here, just even at the top, how to access MERA2 using OpenDAP. Um, so I, de I definitely recommend exploring and taking advantage of these really valuable resources that the JESDISC has put together. Okay, closing that. So now I'll navigate quickly back to the Fluid website. So here, now I wanna emphasize the data access portion. So first, let's see, first I'm going to examine the forecast output. Well, to, back up. So the HTTPS and OpenDAP are sort of direct ways to access the forecast and simulation output. Using the data download tool allows you to subset and download individual variables or spatial domains from the output. So I'm going to click on forecast here. And here are instantaneous and time averaged collections from FP. So scrolling down to some time average collections, here are GSFP 2D time average primary aerosol diagnostics. 
So using, say, PM 2.5 as an example, which we've kind of tried to do throughout this uh, session, clicking on this brings up this site. And you can see all of the different variables available in this collection. So even though PM 2.5 is not a diagnostic, if we wanted to just pull the variables needed to calculate PM 2.5, we can do it using a method like this. So for example, scrolling down, we see black carbon surface mass concentration. So we click that. Here's organic carbon surface mass concentration. Here is dust surface mass concentration for PM for 2.5. Here's nitrate surface mass concentration. Sea salt surface mass concentration, PM 2.5 size bin. Sulfate surface mass concentration. Okay. So clicking on the relevant variables, you can scroll up. Um, if this was a three-dimensional variable, we would select the vertical levels. We can click a subdomain, say, for example, the Eastern US. You can also choose to have the output regridded to different grids. Choose your method of interpolation and also change the output format. I'm going to choose NetCDF4 and download. So now I'm just going to save this file. And open this and it's in my downloads folder. So we'll open that in the next part. So going back to the Fluid website, I now want to navigate through, well, first thing, the CF also has the data download to, tool available. So clicking on forecast, and this site is just structured a little bit differently. So if we want to examine those air quality concentration fields, click download, and we see the available variables within this file. So here, if we want to click PM 2.5, here we're just downloading it for September 21st. And, oh, I, I should mention, um, when looking at vertical levels within GIOS, the surface or the near surface level is actually a level 72 out of 72 levels. Um, so here, we want to download the data for the same, around the same bounding box. Again, you can regrid. And we're going to choose NetCDF4. And we can download the output. And again, that is just in our downloads folder. So now, I want to move on to um, demonstrating the Panoply software. So this is freely available software that is really powerful and allows you to visualize and custom build custom visualizations for NetCDF, HDF, GRIB, and other types of formats. It can be downloaded from the site seen here. You can just Google Panoply NASA GIS. Um, and so I'm going to show you how you can access 
how you can build your own visualization of FP or CF output um, using Panoply after you've downloaded a subset or accessing it remotely so you don't have to download um, a potentially large data file. So here is the blank Panoply interface. In order to open one of our files, hit open. And we have here our CF and FP subsetted output. Clicking on the FP, we can see we have each of the variables that we selected here. We also have information about latitude and longitude and time. Over here, the GO2D indicates that these are georeferenced variables, so we can create latitude longitude maps. So starting with something, say, like organic carbon surface mass, we click our variable, and we can create a plot by clicking this here. Here, there are a lot of different kinds of plots available, um, line plots, georeferenced line plots, zonal averages. Um, we're going to stick to the georeferenced longitude, latitude, color, contour plot, but I definitely recommend um, exploring and playing around with different uh, aspects of these features. Click Create. And here is the subset that we have requested. So there are different, um, these different tabs on the bottom allow us to different to play with different aspects of our visualization here and see that it's zoomed out a little bit. So I am going to go to plot and change our plot size to make it so that we can see. This um, little extra part of the map that shows up when you make it smaller, that doesn't appear if you save the file, like if you save this image. Um, I'm not sure why the software does that. So the array tab gives you information about the variable you're displaying. So in other words, here's plot. Right now we only have one array. If we loaded another variable, we could add those arrays, take the average, say array one minus array two, array one times array two. So there are different um, options for that. If there were different time steps, you would access them through um, these controls here. If we click scale, we can play with um, the units here. Um, we can see these very small values tell us that this is in kilograms per meter cubed. If we want to convert this to something more intuitive, like micrograms per meter cubed, we can use that using the scaling factor here. So we scale it, 10 to the negative 9, enter. And then we now fit to that scaled data. And let's see, we can, by hitting Control, and clicking, we can zoom in on our region. And we can also kind of refine this color scale if we want, say 0 to, say, 35, which is the 24-hour. Oops. And that didn't change it very much. We can reduce it to 10, so it maybe shows up a little bit better. You can change the tick marks. Right here, the scale caption says organic carbon surface mass concentration. You can customize that to say whatever you would like. You can change the location of the caption, get it below the color bar. You can change the color scale itself with the option to reverse the colors. And you can change, we know that we don't have any outliers below. So say, we can say we only want to visualize the right end since we know it gets higher than 10. And you can change this shape of the triangle and the width of this gap here. 
here are options for projection, grid spacing, if we wanted to take off the grid or change the grid to different spacings. There are different overlays for coasts. We chose with this one, we can see the different states provinces within each country. Um, in this, you can view the day-night terminator. You can overlay contours. Um, vector doesn't really apply here, but, oh, and here um, is customization of a title, subtitle. Um, you can opt to not view this data min and max, just unclicking that. So in this way, you can quickly download subsets of individual variables for further analysis. If we wanted, unfortunately, Panoply only allows the loading of two arrays in the plotting window here. Um, otherwise, we might be able to calculate PM 2.5 concentration from FP just using Panoply, but unfortunately, we can only um, visualize two arrays at a time. So, but say we wanted to look at both black carbon and organic carbon added together. We can click on black carbon surface mass concentration, and now we click combine plot, and we can add it to our existing plot. Going back to arrays, we can see that it's, it's doing array one, the organic carbon minus array two, the black carbon, but we want them to be added together you can see the different options here, the different operations. We want array one plus array two to see the combined impact. And so now we have both added together in one plot. And again, you can change the time steps here. And if we wanted to, we could contour these instead of um, the filled colored contours. So now I want to show how, if we didn't download, and we just wanted to access straight from, sorry, we just wanted to access straight from the data server itself, we can go to say the data access here, and we can go directly to the link for each forecast output. So here we navigate to the year and the month, and we can just pick the 20th at zero Z say for initialization time. You can see the four different initialization times here. And when you click on this, it does take a minute to load because it's actually loading all of the forecast output. So here we see all of the collections for the forecast along each forecast hour. So we know that our aerosol relevant variables, right now it's we're scrolling through the instantaneous one hour average files. We scroll even further down. These are instantaneous three hour. And here's the one hour average. And here are a three hour average. So we want the three hour average 2D aerosol collection. So we would like this collection right here. So you can click any, that's not what I wanted to do, right click on here and we copy this link and then we can go back to Panoply and go to file and we can open a remote data set. Copy our link right here and load. And it'll just take a minute 
And here we can see the full suite of variables available for this valid forecast time. And all of the previous examples I gave still apply to all of these. So here we have, going back down, see our, our organic carbon, that's column mass. Here's organic carbon surface mass. We can create a plot. And again, this is the entire domain, so it just takes another second. And you might see something like this. And this is, again, because the model output is in kilograms per meter cubed. So if we perform the same procedure, we scale it to be micrograms per meter cubed. And then we fit to that data. We refine our color scale. Let's say, again, we'll use C35 for the EPA 24 hour standard. And we get a nice global visualization of the FP forecast. And again, all of the other different options apply. So using both the remote access option or the data download subset option, you can create your own visualizations of FP output. So that concludes the demo portion of the webinar. Um, and now we will open it up for questions. So I will put it back here. Thank you. So now hopefully you've been entering your questions in the Q&A portion. And we'll start taking those questions one by one. OK. So starting with question one, how does go-kart deal with secondary organic aerosols? So in the version of go-kart running uh, currently in GSFP, secondary organic aerosols are actually not included. Um, a future update of GSFP will include the most recent version of go-kart. This version includes both the new brown carbon tracer um, as well as secondary organic aerosols. And in that scheme, um, anthropogenic SOA uh, comes from oxidation of the, coming from oxidation of VOCs. Um, these are estimated by scaling both the biomass burning and anthropogenic CO emissions. Um, and the biogenic SOA come from the Megan model. The Megan model uh, provides the biogenic emissions um, to FP. Question two. The models have defined vertical levels, for example, pressure levels. However, the satellite AOD gives us the total column value. What is the range of the column in hectopascal? So, so any column quantity measured by satellite, AOD, or something like total column ozone or total column NO2, um, this will reflect the total amount from the surface uh, to the top of the atmosphere. So the full range. Um, hope that answers that question. But the, the GEOS model, is the 72 vertical levels, are from the near surface to 0.1 hectopascals, in case that was the question. Um, question three, can you please mention the approximate time to release the brown carbon scheme in go-kart or Amer2? So the brown carbon tracer will be in the next update to FP, and this will probably occur in the next six months to one year. Amer2, because it remains consistent throughout its entire production, uh, will never con contain brown carbon. But uh, future long-term reanalyses from GMAO very likely will. So this is more a question of interpolation, data fusion, and machine learning. But do you know any simple models that have satellite and in situ sensor data as input that can be applied in a small area? And if the same model can be applied later in other areas, that do not have in situ sensors. So yes, I think actually I think uh, Pawan's 
uh, example that uh, I highlighted in the Mara 2 case studies is kind of a good example of this. Um, so you can use Mara 2 output and station data um, to come up with a simple model or a machine learning model and apply that model uh, to different areas of that same region that potentially don't have um, sensors. Um, I would caution that you should probably um, restrict the geographic area and time over which you apply that, but, but absolutely. And I think Pawan study is a good example of how you could go about doing that. Okay, can you please give your remark on a possible way to validate local and regional level aerosol mass simulated by reanalysis data? Um, re reanalysis output of aerosol mass uh, can be validated using any available ground observations, but uh, beyond aerosol mass, um, more generally, reanalysis output can be validated using any observations that were not included in the assimilation. Okay, question six. What are the model inputs for anthropogenic SO2 and SO4 emissions? I noticed that monthly emissions data didn't change in recent years when comparing data through Panoply. Um, so currently both FP and CF use SO2 emissions from the HTAP emissions inventory. This inventory is valid for the year 2010 and therefore doesn't reflect recent reductions in SO2 emissions that have occurred over the last decade. Um, these emissions are also supplemented by um, OMI estimated SO2 emissions, um, the ozone monitoring instrument. Um, future updates to FP and CF will include a switch to a different emissions inventory called the Community Emissions Data System Inventory, or SEDS. Um, this will include more recent reductions in SO2 emissions, so that, that should help with that. It's kind of a known issue that was highlighted in the CF uh, validation study. Is it possible to measure CO2 with remote sensing? Yes, absolutely. There are several sensors uh, currently in orbit that measure CO2. The ozone, uh, the, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember what OCO2 stands for right now. <laughs> um, something Carbon Observatory to um, measure CO2 amongst, uh, among other carbon species. I'm not an expert in that area of remote sensing, but absolutely. Are the historical and forecasted data available in Excel format? So I don't think you can download the gridded model output in CSV or Excel, um, but the CF underscore map site um, will allow you to download those time series. So if you interact with the map and click on a location or you choose a location from one of those drop down menus, you should be able to download either the uh, replay time period or the forecast in ASCII, JSON, or Excel format. The map site is down for me. Yeah, unfortunately, there is an issue today with the latest run of GSCF. So I'm so sorry um, this is causing issues right now, but hopefully this will be fixed by later today if you want to try back another time. And um, today's presentation will be available in recording form. So if you want to go back and watch, um, hopefully it'll it'll be working at a at a future time. Which GMAO product do you recommend to study aerosols or past data over South Asia? So I think this will very likely depend on the um, sort of the how far back in time you want to go. Um, and what exactly you would like to use it for. So if you're looking for a relatively consistent time series over a longer period of time, and you're looking at something like, you know, PM 2.5, then MARA 2 will be the best bet. But if you are focused on specifically on, you know, the changing aerosol species, um, and you want to look on shorter timescales, for example, since 2018, then the GSCF replay could also be a good resource because um, just a reminder, MARA2 does not include nitrates and um, the GS chem chemical mechanism that's used 
uh, in GLCF includes uh, secondary organic aerosols. So are there some collections or data sets with pollen information? Yes, but I don't know of any. GIOS currently doesn't really represent uh, pollen within its modeling system. So I'm sorry, I don't have any information about uh, particular uh, data sets. And there are, there are no collections um, in GIOS, in, like the collections that I've described today that would uh, have information about pollen. Which type of data is more accurate, analysis or reanalysis? So a reanalysis represents analysis over a long period of time using a consistent data simulation method and model system. So one isn't really more accurate than the other. One hap a reanalysis happens over much longer time scales or over longer time scales than analysis. And the reanalysis really represents that consistent system, both data assimilation and model forecast over the entire period. That's what sort of makes it um, uh, stand out, I guess. Um, whereas an analysis, you know, in something like FP, um, that's able to capitalize on advancements in both data uh, assimilation um, improvements to the observing system and improves, improvements to the underlying forecast model, sort of in real time. Okay, any comments on COVID-19 and GEOS model forecasts? Um, so if, well, we know that there were definite changes in emissions as a result of lockdown measures associated with the COVID-19 pandemic and emissions inventories are created on much longer timescales than those events happened. So the emissions inventories that are used in the modeling systems, you know, especially the forecast models, they don't capture um, those quick changes in emissions. Um, there are current um, research activities underway to improve our emissions inventories so that our 2020 simulations more accurately uh, represent the changes in emissions that we saw as a result of um, those lockdown measures. Is it possible to make a downscaling with WARF Chem using GSCF as initial conditions? Yes, I don't see why not. Um, I, I, am not an, I am not an expert in downscaling techniques, but um, if you're using um, that, you know, 2018 um, to present replay period, um, that re represents kind of a consistent data set that definitely could be used as either boundary conditions or uh, for downscaling using something like WarfCam. What are the major differences between GIOS and MERA2 in the context of an aerosol module? Um, okay, if, if the question there is GSFP, so the GSFP being the near real time forecast, MERA2 being the long term reanalysis. The way they differ currently is the version of go-kart um, that is in GSFP includes nitrates and the version of go-kart that was used to uh, create MERA2 does not have nitrates. Um, another difference between the current version of GSFP and MERA2 is the type of assimilation used. So MERA2 uh, uses a 3D um, NVAR data assimilation technique um, to do its data assimilation throughout the entire time period. GSFP 
uses a hybrid 4D and bar data simulation technique um, to assimilate AOD. So those are the two major differences between both the go-kart aerosol module and the AOD data simulation between GSFP and MERA2. I'll pause to see if there are any more questions. These are great questions. Thank you. Is there a RESTful API to access that data to get it per each request without using the web page without downloading anyone? I do not know the answer to this. Um, this, is this is hitting the limits of my computing expertise. <laughs> um, if you email um, one of the websites um, that I've listed here or go to the GMAO website, um, you can find out more information about this. Um, I, I, I believe there is, but uh, to get um, more specific information about it, I would go to the GM, GMAO website. So, Winner Brock, do we have to, do we have any more questions? No, nope. it looks like that might be it. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending today's session. Our next session will be in two days on Thursday, same time, and we will cover uh, similar uh, information as today, except for the ECMWF CAMS modeling system. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.